Bad neighbours are our worst nightmare. Oi! The truth always comes out, scumbag. Noise and bad behaviour are one thing. You bitch! I'm calling the police right now. There's always nasty neighbours picking on us. Give me my dog! But even the smallest irritations can end up boiling over into shocking violence. I thought, this is it. This man's going to kill me. What the hell's the man again? This is what happens when neighbours attack. There was blood everywhere. And he just went like that, and I just went... It doesn't seem like the likely scene of a fight. These leafy streets of a quiet Suffolk village are more usually filled with the quiet hum of lawnmowers, the sound of birdsong, or the distant voice of a cricket commentator coming from someone's TV. Oh, I was sitting in the chair over here, watching uh, England play Australia in the cricket. And suddenly, in front of this window here, I saw a face looking through the window. In August 2013, Roger Coleman was to witness an extraordinary scene in front of the home he'd moved into in search of a restful retirement. Little Blakenham is a very tiny village and uh, it was nice and quiet. But what he didn't know was that the village was like a pressure cooker waiting to explode. The previous owners came back to see us and said, uh, you know, how are you doing, how are you settling down? And we said, fine. And then he actually warned me, whatever you do, don't have anything to do with Mr Keane. He's trouble. Mr Keane was 71-year-old Michael Keane, who'd lived in the village for 40 years, and he wasn't having a peaceful retirement. Any little thing he can do to wind anybody up, he does it. Jane Hervey had lived three doors down from Michael Keane for 15 years. He sees us coming and then comes out and shout abuse over the fence at us. And the language that come out is disgusting. Jane and some of the other neighbours were convinced Mr Keane was out to harass them, and she reported him to the police. But Mr Keane insisted it was them picking on him. Faced with an impasse, the police gave Jane some advice. Jane came and saw me that she'd been advised by the police that the uh, diary that she'd filled up with all the abuse wasn't really sufficient, that you needed either a video or audio uh, evidence so they could do... That's the only way they could do anything. Roger, who had the house opposite Michael Keane, agreed to put up a camera to record his behaviour. Just a few weeks later, it was about to capture something shocking. Suddenly, in front of this window here, I saw a face looking through the window and then a camera taking a picture of this camera. And straight away, I recognised it as Mr Keane. And slowly, he walked back towards his property. And I went out after him to see what he was up to. Roger wasn't the only resident to spot Mr Keane. Jane Hervey also followed Roger outside. I thought to myself, I can't let him go out on his own. And as we walked towards him, he went backwards as fast as he could. Jane got there first. And then he says, egg me on to come to his driveway. Come on, come on in front of my driveway. I followed him on his driveway and I was telling him, just leave us alone. What is your problem? Just leave us alone. Jane had spent months trying to prove her neighbour was harassing her. With the camera in Roger's window running, she was about to have her chance. I said, look what you've just done to me. You've assaulted me. But the punch was just the beginning. Absolutely disgusting. Even though another neighbour was calling the police, Michael Keane wasn't deterred. And, believing she was getting the evidence she needed, Jane stood her ground. I'm shouting out to Jane, come on, come on, don't go anywhere near him, come away. You've got two witnesses, he's hit you. That's good enough. Then his wife came out, telling me to get off her property. <laughs> Bang, hit her again. Now she managed to stay on her feet, I don't know. To hit a woman like that was absolutely disgusting. Afterwards, I'm thinking, oh, my God, what had just happened? I can't believe he'd just done this to me. 
So we think, right, okay, I'm going to get this guy. He's, he's got to be punished for this. Michael Keane pleaded guilty to assault. The neighbours hoped he would be given a custodial sentence. It was not to be. He was sent home with no restrictions to assault a woman like that. Um, he should have been put inside and done some time in prison. For Jane and all the other neighbours here, that was soul-destroying. Michael Keane was given an absolute discharge, which is just a formal record that he had committed a criminal offence. He didn't get nothing for my assault, and I didn't get no justice. With no restrictions to stay away from his neighbours, Roger was intent on watching Michael Keane 24-7 but that didn't seem to stop the abuse or his habit of making noise. Mr Keane has a, a leaf blower. He uses it all the time. It's pathetic. There was no leaves on the floor. And he would have it on for an hour sometimes just to annoy us neighbours. If he was a slug, I would throw him on the floor, I would put salt round him so he explodes. In 2014, Michael Keane got slapped with a two-year antisocial behaviour order protecting Jane, Roger and their families from any threatening or insulting behaviour or using any noise-generating equipment outside his own home. But just weeks later, Roger had a run-in with Michael Keane in his car. Suddenly, unexpectedly, he turned and drove across my side of the road, which made me break. Could have easily ended up in the field and both of us could have lost our lives and got straight on the phone to the police. And I saw the three police officers knocking on his door. I asked him to come quietly, but he obviously wasn't very happy about that. The police had come to question Mr Keane on the driving incident. But as they took him to a second police car out of view of Roger's CCTV, the 70-year-old started a battle with the boys in blue. There was a struggle, and then suddenly he just seemed to want to get away from them, and they, uh, jumped on top of him, on top of the bonnet of the car, and he was kicking his legs out, kicked one of the officers, and uh, then they eventually put handcuffs on him and took him away. No charges were brought against Mr Keane for his close shave with Roger, but he was charged with resisting a police sergeant, assaulting a police sergeant, and harassment towards some of his neighbours. He was found guilty and was issued an £820 fine. He was, however, allowed to return home to the close. All we want to do is to live in this neighbourhood peacefully, quietly and happily. And we can't do that with him in the corner. We like the little village. No, we're all going to stay. If anybody moves, it will be him and we're staying here. And that's it as far as I'm concerned. Michael Keane declined to take part in this programme. But he told us he factually disputes these allegations, insisting his neighbours have a history of offending against him. And in February 2015, Roger Coleman was issued with a police information notice for antagonising Mr Keane by posting details of his conviction in public places. Roger, Jane and the other residents are still living in the same street and tensions remain high. Coming up, when a neighbour attacks with a hammer. My husband had blood all over his face and I thought he was dead. And another gets a knife on his own doorstep. He raised his right arm and he was holding the carving knife. Every year, it's estimated that more than 350,000 people move home because of problems with their neighbours. And aggressive behaviour was behind over half of decisions to sell up. Sometimes, things get so violent, neighbours use whatever they can lay their hands on to get revenge on those next door. He's threatened to blow our house up. He's threatened to put bricks through our windows. Before I can even reach the pipe, he's at me like that, like that. And I'm flat on my back. And he's on top of me and I can't get up. In a secluded part of Wales in 2012, a man charged through a fence threatening his neighbour with a two-pound lump hammer with absolutely no warning. There was blood everywhere. Blood was all over the place. I looked like something out of a horror picture. In 
It was something James Killian couldn't have imagined when he moved to the beautiful Welsh countryside with his wife Angela and their two boys in 2006. Everything was ideal. Um, the kids could do what they wanted and Gower offered all the things that uh, we had expected that it would offer. We'd been here about five years then and everything had been lovely. Behind our property, uh, we have a property called Cannesland Park, which is a mobile home site, mainly for retirement people. We thought, well, uh, you know, that's going to be quiet. Elderly people, it's not going to be any hassle. It's been just a nightmare. But the events that followed five years after moving in changed their lives forever. It was a cracking hot day. Uh, we hadn't had a day like that for a long time. We were out in the garden trying to tidy it up. We had some twigs that had naturally fallen off the tree here and uh, we decided to burn them and get rid of them. So I had made the fire and the smoke just went up and more or less disappeared. And then I heard a lady shouting over the fence and she said to put the fire out. And they were complaining about a small amount of smoke that really wasn't going in their direction anywhere. She was quite nasty. She was quite abrupt. I said, OK, so we'll put it out. And with that, I turned to my husband and I said, put the fire out, will you? And I said, we've got to keep the peace. Famous last words. So I had put two buckets of water on the fire. I had scattered it out and I was getting another bucket of water to put on it. And then I remembered that the, the Chelsea Flower Show was on. And that's when I went back inside. And as I got to this position, I saw a man coming from the corner of my garden who had forced his way in. The man was a resident of the caravan park, 72-year-old, 18-stone James Sherrod. And the couple had no idea of the level of violence they were about to witness. It was at this point that he pulled a hammer out from behind his back and hit me over the head with it, just at this position. Uh, I naturally put my hand up, uh, just pure instinct and self-preservation, I guess. But he made contact with my head and then continued to hit me in a motion like this on top of my head and I went right down on the ground here immediately. And he was on top of me. I was in such a state of, of concussion, panic and terror, so I then started shouting and screaming. As soon as I looked over, I could see that there was a man on top of my husband and my husband had blood all over his face and I thought he was dead. And then luckily my wife came out running and shouting from the back of the house and managed to push him off me. He had the hammer in his hand and I said, you've been hitting him with that hammer. And he came up to me with his chest out and he put it behind his back and said, what hammer? Then all of a sudden then I heard some shouting coming from the road and a cyclist had been passing by. There was blood everywhere. Blood was all over the place. As the cyclist said, I look like something out of a horror picture. That's when they turned tail and, and just went through the gap. The horrified cyclist called the police. The attacker with the hammer, James Sharrod, was arrested at the scene and charged with wounding and inflicting grievous bodily harm. Uh, this, is, this is a picture of uh, my head afterwards, just immediately after leaving hospital. Uh, you can see I had eight stitches across here. There were lumps underneath the hairline, where he also had hit me but hadn't cracked the skin open throughout the hairline. At the time, I thought I was having my last breath. I thought the game was up. We just couldn't believe that something like that could happen. If I hadn't been here, then he would have been dead. The horrific violence of that assault has haunted the couple ever since. Since the attack, I have serious depression. I see the futility of life. Uh, I'm basically a shell of my former self. My wife is a mental wreck, really. She won't go anywhere at all now without me with her. In court, Sharrod pleaded not guilty, but he was convicted of wounding and sentenced to 12 months in prison. As the judge said, if he was a few years younger, uh, he'd be getting 10 to 15 years. Does it mean then if you pass 50 or 60, you can do what you want with a two-pound lump hammer? Whilst Mr. Sharrod was in prison, the family were able to breathe a sigh of relief and spent the next year rebuilding their lives. They'd planned to put up a wall for added protection, but before they'd began, they got some very disturbing news about the man who had attacked James. 
In July of this year, we were informed that Sharrod was back at his home, which is essentially 30 yards from our boundary. He's there living in the, enjoying the freedom of Gower, enjoy the freedom of, of this nice, beautiful area, but we can't. We're terrified. We're living here in fear that he's going to come around and do it again. We contacted Mr. Sharrod for his version of events, but he chose not to respond. The transformation has been tremendous to my family, wife, and their well-being. Why should my kids have to suffer uh, because of this violent, ignorant criminal? Even now, I, I still see my husband with that man on top of him. That, that horror, I don't suppose, will ever, ever go. The Killians tell us that the hammer-wielding attacker is still living on their doorstep and they're struggling to move on. Whether the conflict turns violent or not, no one wants a nightmare neighbour. I thought, oh my God, what has moved in? Having a hellish relationship with next door can cut property prices by up to £30,000. I wanted him to either drop dead or leave. Sometimes what starts with cross words over the fence can escalate to danger with shocking speed. I don't even feel safe with the doors locked because you don't know what that man's going to do next. In a quiet street in Sheffield, a dispute that began with noise complaints ended in a street brawl that left a retired resident fearing for his life. He raised his right arm and he was holding the carving knife. 69-year-old retired paratrooper Rod Scott had lived peacefully in his road for more than 20 years until a new family, the Halls, moved in next door. For the first few years, the neighbours lived in peace. But according to Scott, relations took a turn for the worse one afternoon in 2006. I was working in my garden all day and I was playing this Pavarotti tape and I heard this voice screaming and shouting, Rod, Rod, Rod! And I walked out to see Hall storming down his driveway. The first thing he said was, turn that off, don't take the piss out of me, I will sort you out. So I phoned the police and I asked them could they have a word in his ear and um, explain that he couldn't conduct himself like this in the community and nip it in the bud. And I think that was the biggest mistake because after that it just grew out of all proportion. Mrs Hall used to have a camcorder and here is a photograph of her with the camcorder. She used to hold up signs that said paedophile twat, paranormal, written on it. Mrs Hall claims that it was Rod who was the unreasonable neighbour and was collecting video evidence against him. Rod says he'd done nothing wrong. But one summer evening, Rod claims the Halls ramped up their campaign. It was nearly midnight. I was working in my garage, just tidying up a little. I got to about here. There was a flash of light and Mr. Hall was leaning up round the panels that were down the side of the fence uh, with a camera and he shouted, gotcha. And I'd been working in my garage all night long, just tidying up a little. There was no noise, never was any noise. And there was no way they could hear me, not with the road traffic. And um, that's what I had to put up with. The Halls have denied this event took place, but the next morning, Rod got a shock visit. Two police officers came into my kitchen and they produced this. It was a harassment first course of conduct. The allegations were the fact that I was shaking the fence separating the properties, that I was making loud noises at night up to the time of midnight, also for verbal abuse. None of these were true. Having been issued with a harassment warning, Rod tried to keep away from the halls. But one night in June 2008, Rod was saying goodbye to his friend Ian outside when the row with his neighbours was suddenly reignited in explosive fashion. Ian had gone round to his side to get him to drive and there was Mrs Hall giving us nasty hand signals. Ian was looking and I said to him, that's what I'm having to put up with day in, day out. Within a few seconds, Hall had come out of his house. He came straight across the pavement, went round to the other side of the car, 
whereupon he put his arm around Ian's neck in this manner and screamed at him, I will have you, you bastard. I was standing on this side. I shouted at Hall, don't be so stupid, get back in your house. And Hall came up. He just swung a wild punch and caught me bang in the ear. He knocked my spectacles off. They finished up somewhere down there. I did manage to, with an outstretched arm, I struck out for his eyes in this manner because I've got fairly long arms to keep him at, at arm's length. But Rod's army self-defence tactics appeared to anger Mr Hall even further. I saw Hall walk across the grass and he went up to the door and then within a second or so he was walking back down again and it wasn't until he got into the middle of the grass did I see that he raised his right arm and he was holding the carving knife. He was hacking down with the knife and the knife came down and just went between my fingers. Witnesses had seen the fight and called the police. They arrived and arrested Mr Hall. But as he was being taken away, his wife had a few final words for Rod. Mrs Hall shouted at them, this man's called me a gypsy. And then she immediately shouted, I put a gypsy curse on you. And with her hands held up in the air, she said, I curse you, I curse you, I curse you. And as I backed over the road, the curse must have been working because I tripped over my shoelace. Mr Hall was convicted on two counts of common assault for the knife fight and bailed. Mrs Hall denies putting a curse on Rod. He was found guilty on all counts. And um, I feel that giving him 250 hours community work uh, was a bit of an insult for, in my eyes, an attempted murder because he'd been threatening to kill me for 23 months. Both sides claim they were the innocent parties in the dispute, and in 2009, the Halls moved out of the house next door to Rod. But his nightmares didn't end there. Rod says he then started to receive threatening letters in the post. He says, you still hear, Scott, it's about time that you move somewhere else. I think these letters just tell you the story. The Halls have denied sending any letters and say they have never threatened Rod or called him a paedophile. Rod Scott tells us that since filming, the threatening post has now stopped and he can finally put the ominous day of the knife attack behind him, but he is forever on his guard. Coming up, when a neighbour is attacked in his car and a brutal punch-up on the street. He was saying to Matthew, he said, I'm going to do you, you're dead. When once peaceful neighbours fall out, tempers flare. Oh, what? You all right? What you do? Hey? And a war quickly becomes harassment and abuse. Not really? Sometimes words are no longer enough and families become prisoners in their own homes. You're a scummy tramp. Your mother's a scummy tramp. In fact, you are a pair of scummy tramp bitches. A quiet cul-de-sac in a seaside town in Devon was home to a number of families seeking a quiet life. But when new residents moved in, everything changed overnight. I honestly feel that you're not much of a man if you allow another guy to start bullying your wife. The hell do you think you do, mate? It all started in 1999, when Wayne Howard bought what he hoped was his dream home. This is my lovely street. It's a private road. After 13 years contentedly living alone, Wayne began a new chapter when he met Daisy via a friend online. We're just out the bestest friends and, yeah, meant for each other. After marrying in the Philippines in 2012, Wayne returned to the UK to prepare for Daisy's arrival. A few weeks later, he met another new arrival to the road, Roger Peach. Neither had any idea at the first meeting that things would ramp up to fifth gear. I think he came driving past the one day, introduced himself. He seemed a little bit flamboyant. 
Well, he seemed a nice enough guy. He looked like one of the Craze brothers, like a gangster. I did laugh. But relations between the two men went pear-shaped, all because of a communal tree. He said, straight away, I want to cut the tree down. And I said, Mr. Peach, I said, the tree's owned by all of us. He said, yes, I know that. He said, would you not like it cut down? I said, no. He said, well, what if I pay you to cut it down? No, I said, I, I don't want to cut it down. Mr. Peach recalls this conversation differently. Mr. Howard told me that he would willingly take the tree down for 300 pounds. I told him that I was going to get a professional tree surgeon to actually sort the tree out. One morning, a month later, Wayne awoke to the sound of chainsaws. Came here, there's a man chopping the branches off up there. And I said, excuse me, mate, you do realise that we all own this tree? And he said, hang on, he came down, he said, I'm ever so sorry, he said, um, Mr. Peach promised that he'd owned the tree and he had lied to him. According to Wayne, the council then put a preservation order on the tree. But this argument had sparked what was to become an explosive fight. Wayne had been eagerly awaiting his bride, Daisy, and decided to film the area to show her where she'd be living. But he wasn't expecting to film an attack by his neighbour. I thought it was recording outwards, but pure fluke, it was actually facing inwards, which I, I didn't know at the time. I come to drive down here, and Peachy runs out of his house there, uh, runs straight in front of the car. I put a brake on. He then comes around here, rips the door open, and dives in on top of me. What the hell's the matter with you? He grabbed me. Um, the hell? This is so off. <laughs> he was biting my hand, my, my finger. Thanks. It's like he's walking dead or something. Kind of eating. <laughs> he looked mad as hell. He looked so mad. And then he was saying something like, "Have you ever been put in a hospital? I'm going to put you in a hospital." When's the last time you were put in a hospital? I was thinking, "Oh my God, I'm being attacked by granddad that wants to put me in a hospital." Literally, the car then starts to roll. It gathers speed. And then as we get to here, the speed really picks up. It goes straight into the fence. This door then slams on his legs. The gate wedged into the car and crumpled all the front of my car and stopped us dead. The hell do you think you do, mate? That's a shit thing to do, isn't it? Roger Peach admits the attack, but claims it was events earlier in the day that led to the alleged carjacking when his wife was home alone. She has asked us to protect her identity. Wayne Howard, he came right up to the vents and was filming and grinning like a maniac. And it was really, really bizarre and I'm scared. As I pulled up outside the house, my wife, who was in floods of tears, I lost my temper. What do you mean, you? What the hell's the matter with you? I didn't attack him. I caught him by the scruff of the neck. I did not attack him. I didn't carjack him. That's another lie. Oh. Why? Simply, it upset my wife. I honestly feel that you're not much of a man if you allow another guy to start bullying your wife. Wayne claims there were no witnesses to this event. He did call the police about the attack in the car, however, and Roger was cautioned. Wayne says he was seriously injured and was signed off work. But he made sure that what happened on that day ricocheted around not just the street, but around the worldwide internet community. His boss saw him on YouTube as the world's oldest carjacker and sacked him. When was the last time you were in the hospital? That made Mr. Peach extra, extra angry. I wasn't sacked from the job whatsoever. Uh, I actually left the job of my own accord because I didn't want to cause the company any embarrassment. Of course I was upset. What can you do about it? There's nothing you can do about it. Dandruff. We all suffer from dandruff now and again, so what you do is you dust it off and you continue on. You can get a picture of me and Mr Peach together. Since filming, Wayne tried to get an injunction against Mr Peach, but failed and had to pay £900 in solicitor's fees to Mr. Peach, plus court costs. Mr. Peach has now decided to sell up and leave. Don't think he likes me. 
Moving out is always the last resort, but all over Britain, thousands of neighbours are at war. In one year alone, we made almost six million official complaints to environmental health about our neighbours. For noise... The nail gun, for a week, that's all I heard. It was unbelievable. Chung, 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 chung. And mess. It would start lots of, like, rubbish. It was opposite my kitchen window, and it just, just looked awful. Sometimes, however, constant complaints can cause one neighbour to snap. And when disputes get violent, things can get far worse than they ever were before. I felt a cut to my face. I was scared every day coming out of my flat. Look at you shaking! Fuck, look at you! In one picturesque village in the Devon countryside, one family got into a dispute with another family that got so out of hand it would cost them their livelihood. The Webb's family dispute began when their son Matthew had an ongoing disagreement with a neighbour. He was saying to Matthew, he said, I'm going to do you, you're dead. It was something the Webb family couldn't have imagined when they moved to the village of Robra. It seemed like the perfect place for Tina and Steve to bring up their daughters, Sarah and Charlene, and son Matthew. The neighbourhood in itself was absolutely great. Yeah. Know? It's like a proper old village, isn't yeah. it? Always saying, I oh, yeah, you have a little yacht and that, and then talk long to do your day's work. <laughs> in March 2008, Richard Brown and his partner moved in, just a few doors up from the webs. Within weeks, tensions seemed to grow over road space as arguments began over the webs' five vehicles. Richard Brown was stood on the end of the drive, shouting that he's got nowhere to park. And when I actually looked up, by his area, he, he had his parking space there. Steve heard the shouting and he come running down and said, what's going on? And Mr Brown started shouting that he's fed up with parking around here and he's had enough. So Steve said, oi, you know, don't talk to my wife and child like that again, like, you know? And um, he said, oh, look, I'm so sorry, he said. Can we shake hands? I'm not in a happy mood. My son got injured in a boxing ring and it's quite upset me. The Webbs hoped that would be the end of the matter. Tina was a childminder and had CCTV up for the children's health and safety. But little did she know she would soon capture an even more explosive outburst. Matthew went to get some shopping. On the way back, as Matthew approached outside the house, Richard Brown called him up. I heard a lot of shouting and screaming. I looked out the window to um, see that Richard Brown had had my son Matthew and was punching him in, uh, around the head and around the face, really aggressive. Matthew was trying to hold his head down like that and push him away. And as Matthew was pushing away, Richard Brown was grabbing him with more and punching him more to the face and head. He was punching him underneath, lifted his legs off the floor, really punching him. He was saying to Matthew, he said, I'm going to um, do you, I'm going to hammer you, and you're dead. And then as I ran at the front door, he threw him on the floor like a rag doll. He just didn't want to let go. He just wanted to punch, punch, punch. And I said, what are you doing? What's it all about? And he said, I just ate the And that, that's exactly what he said. Richard Brown was cautioned by the police, but he claims he was provoked by Matthew, who had driven dangerously moments before and had actually attacked Richard outside his house first, making threats to his family. The aftershock of that day still rumbles on for both families. Just months later, the Webb family were walking home from the pub when things kicked off yet again. As we walked past the post box, coming down towards Richard Perron's house, he said, I'm gonna smash your cars up, burn your house. He said, you'll be in bed one night and you'll burn to death with your family. And threatened me with all that. And I said, if you do that, I'll say, I'll kill you. Richard Brown denies the abuse. He claims he called the police after Matthew damaged their vehicle with a baseball bat and after hearing the Webb family shouting threats. Matthew had a baseball bat and he said, he's not going to hurt me again. And Matthew feared for himself. And he had the and, bat and to protect himself. Matthew and Steve Webb were arrested and cautioned. But whatever really happened that night, one thing was clear. The beating on the street had broken down relations forever. There was no, no 
no fighting or anything. The, the things we've shame. retaliated to is through things they've made us retaliate to, to you know defend I mean? ourselves. Relations between the families continue to disintegrate. Tina claimed Richard was harassing her at her door, which he denied. But then Tina was issued with a caution for harassment herself, and she was warned to have no direct or indirect contact with the Browns. And after more complaints from the family, she was convicted of harassment and issued with a restraining order. I was given a two-year suspended sentence to stay away from Richard and his family. If not, I would get anything up to five years imprisonment. And um, I was given 50 hours community service. Um, I had the tag around my ankle, which was on here, for two months. Seven o'clock in the evening, I had to be in. And I wasn't allowed out until seven o'clock in the morning. So I was just like a prisoner in my own home, really. Couldn't even go to an Halloween party with my grandson. The problems continued on the street. Richard Brown was soon given a harassment warning himself. Attempts at mediation failed when the webs walked out and anonymous complaints about her child mining business meant Tina shut up shop. We shut the business down basically because of all the aggravation we've had. There's only so much you can take before breaking point, to be honest. Both families tell us the fight and the events that followed have caused their families immense stress. Since we met them, the Webbs have continued to complain to the police about the Brown's behaviour, but no charges have been brought. The Webb family plan to move, but for the moment, the two families are still living far too close for comfort. Coming up, one family nearly pushed an entire neighbourhood to breaking point. She just punched me in the face. Falling out with next door can make home life a living nightmare. Don't put your shit up against my fence. But neighbourly disputes can affect an entire community. People would drive along here, mouthing evil bits. And when tensions boil over, the consequences can be terrifying. Police, I think, I'm being um, intimidated by my neighbours. I've got sticky hands now. This family knows exactly what it's like to upset the community. Warring with local residents has forced them out of their home. You're only meant to have a couple of pieces, not the whole thing. Oh, shut up. Following several unhappy abodes, Philip and Audrey Chawner moved to Ramsbottom, hoping they'd found their forever home. Their household included their two daughters, Sam and Emma. Sammy! Oh, Sammy! Sandwich! And the family's beloved pets. She's disappeared in between her boobs. That's just wrong. Ow! Oh, it bit it. me! All right, that's fine, yeah. But life in their new home was to start with a bang, thanks to their pampered pooch. Our neighbour complained about her barking 24 hours a day, which was never true. Uh, do you know when that window being open, that like, it's made the dog worse. <laughs> they had certainly made an impression on their neighbours, some of whom didn't want to be identified. This dog was a nightmare. It could often be the first thing I would hear in the morning and the last thing at night. It was relentless. <coughs> Our pets are more important than our neighbours. Our pets are like a family to us. The complaints kept coming about everything from a noisy TV. I'm going to watch a supermarket sweep, fall in a bed and then uh, come down with me. To shouting in the street. There's a torrent of abuse and foul language, and they just didn't want to know. Dad, the lead's down there, by the yeah. curtain. We used to hear them screaming at each other on numerous occasions. What do you want? Oh, shut up. In Ramsbottom, we were victimised. We're being called fat jelly dubbies. Fatties, we've been called who eats all the pies. They made out that they were being picked on because of the size. What we do in our own house and how we need our own lives is our own. Hmm, absolutely gorgeous. 
Seven years after moving in, there'd been over 500 complaints about the Chawners, but they had no idea just how far they'd pushed their neighbours. One day, while out walking the dogs, simmering tensions between the family and those on the street finally erupted. We had this gang come towards us. Uh, about four, was it four, pushed me away. They grabbed hold of you, yeah. They pinged me back. So, um He started asking you what my mum and dad's names are. Yeah. They and he started said, calling our dog. I was across in my front room. Uh, and I heard a bit of kerfuffle outside. I looked across and the two Chowner girls were stood here, right in front of the wall. As I walked round to the front door to come across and see what the trouble was, I heard a scream. She just punched me in the face and I just got really angry. I'm not saying it's right to retaliate, but there's only so much abuse anybody can take before they reach their breaking point. The two Chowner girls were running up the road and the other girl was running down the road. I don't know if I was swearing, but probably was. <laughs> she was fuming. And I remember we were best for the door and I shouted my dad. And when I answered the door, she was actually standing there with her hand over her eye and crying her eyes out. Philip Chawner heard it was a neighbour who had hit his daughter and decided to confront her. He was hammering on the door. I thought he was going to knock the door down. I told the resident of the house to shut the door immediately. If I wanted him to hit anybody, I wanted him to hit me and not the resident. Busy Body Stewart, who's on the committee for the council, actually come over and he actually said that Emma caused all the trouble and um, he stood right close to me like he was going to punch me. And he put his fist up to hit me. I personally would have rather him have hit me because we might have got him off the estate a bit quicker. The punch had left Emma Chawner with a black eye. It makes me feel sick looking at it because I had to go through this. The street fight had spiralled completely out of control and the fallout of that day put the entire neighbourhood on edge. When I came round in the car one day and there was a video camera um, hanging out of the window up there. I was spying on people, we are getting evidence. I uh, got up one morning and uh, fat was written into the car and also we had scratches into the car also, uh, which was done, I don't know, with a key or a um, pen knife. Neighbourly relations had sunk to an all-time low. Do you get a kick out of a scratch in our car? Who, me? Nowhere. Me? You think I want to go near your car? What's the point? Because you do. I've I don't want to use the word hate because I don't hate people, but I think they were so disliked, it got that they were hated by people. After the fight, the build-up of complaints against the Chawners led to them getting a restraining order. And finally, an eviction order. This neighbourhood could take the Chawners no longer. I'm glad they no longer live here, as they made our life an absolute misery. Uh, I wouldn't like to see anybody in that situation. But for all the pain that they've caused people, I cannot feel sorry for them, really. You fussy awkward! I'll give you the paper, you stick it in. The Chawners found a new place to live, but by 2012, their new neighbours had already complained, and Philip, Emma and Sam were convicted of threatening behaviour against a neighbour. And I thought to myself, oh my God, here we go again. Is there anywhere we can move and not have all this sort of chucked back in our faces again? If you see a family that look like the Chonas coming down the street, looking at a house near you, full of the estates, shut up, and sell it as fast as you possibly can. Have you got a nightmare neighbour story? 
get in touch at channel5.com forward slash Nightmare Neighbour. Catch the Nightmare Neighbour next door when Neighbours spy next Wednesday at 8. Check in for some fun with the extraordinary staff at the Special Needs Hotel here on Channel 5. Catch that brand new tomorrow at 10. Whilst coming up tonight, there's a nasty surprise heading the housemate's way. Stay right where you are for Celebrity Big Brother next. <laughs>